everybody. <laughs> we're going to do a little different meditation today than we're probably used to doing. It's going to involve some chanting, a guided meditation, and two periods of, for us to be in the silence. So what I would like to do is, first of all, invite you to sit up in your chair, however is comfortable, your feet square on the floor. And I also want to just preface this by saying anything that I suggest we do is totally optional for everybody. But I believe if we do the things I'm talking about, the, the experience will just be more potent. Let's just put it that way. So the thing I forgot to do be before I came up here is, and I'm going to invite you to do, is if you are comfortable and able to and feel good about it, to actually take off your shoes. Okay? That's the first thing. So I am going to do that as well. And again, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, don't. Ooh, that feels good. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with a chant. And I'm going to explain to you what the chant means, so you don't have to worry about what the chant means. But it's more important what the chant does than what it means. Roughly, the chant means, um, so that, well, I'll just give you the chant. The chant is Ong, O-N-G, Namo, Guru Dev, Namo. Ong, O-N-G, is the creative energy of the universe manifested. So it's like Om, which is unmanifested, but this is manifested. So we're talking about the creative energy of the universe manifested right now. Now, Mo means I honor. So we're saying I honor the creative energy of the universe that's, that's present right now. That's the first part. So it's Ong Namo, Guru Dev. It looks like Guru Dev, but we're going to say Guru Dev because when we flick um, our tongue on the top of our mouth, we activate certain meridians and things which will help us enhance the experience of it. Okay? Guru Dev. Is, the, is our inner divinity, okay? So Guru Dev is like God within us, the divine within us, okay? And then we say Namo again, Namo. Namo is we honor that, okay? So that's what we're saying. What it does is all kinds of stuff which you'll experience. So we're gonna start with that. Then what's gonna happen is I have two wonderful people with me today. <laughs> Um, Jess is going to be doing the guided meditation part, okay? And then Rachel is going to help you know when we're chanting. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to chant, and then all of us are going to chant together three times. You don't have to remember all this stuff, just it'll, it'll all happen, it'll be great. At the very end, though, we're going to do a different chant, okay? The chant at the end is just two words, Sat Nam. Sat Nam means it's very powerful because it means truth is my identity. Okay, so that's what it means. Hard to say. <laughs> um, anyway, so there'll be two periods of silence. So just kind of go with it. So if you're used to just, oh, there's one period of silence that's going to be done. Don't worry, you'll get to bask in it longer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So we're going to make sure I'm in the right key here. We're going to start. Om Namo Guru Dev Namo Om Namo Guru Dev Namo Dev Namo 
relax into your chair and press your feet consciously to the earth. Start to deepen your breath, inviting it down into your abdomen. Place your hands on your stomach, drawing your breath down to your hands. Imagine a spark there under your hands, a glow in your center, your personal transmutational core. Allow your breath to stoke this energy and feel it get bigger. Let it start to fill up the center of you, warm, glowing, generous, healthy. And from this glowing ball of your essence, direct a beam of energy from it down, down your legs, through the portals of your feet, through the floor, down into the very center of the earth. And tether that energy to the molten heart of our home and offer to it the past. Allow the regrets, the resentments, the mistakes, the suffering to slide down and become one again with all. Allow that beautiful energy of safety and comfort and nurture that our home embodies to flow up and into your bright energy center. Feel your breath under your hands and feel that dynamic connection between dust and dust. And know you are not your past. You are not missing pieces. You are not forgotten glory. We are ancient, but we are brand new. And every breath we take shares with us the strength of simply being. Always beginning, always ending, vulnerable, enduring, decaying, nurturing, resolution, flux. Om Namo Guru Dev Namo Om Namo Guru Dev Namo Om Namo Guru Dev Now bring some of that spark from your abdomen up to your third eye. Knock lightly on the doorway of your truest self. Direct a beam of energy up, 
up, up, beyond where you can fathom, out past the atmosphere, the galaxy. Imagine a net of light shimmering and plug your energy directly into that net, a direct line to divine consciousness, to your divinity, a loop in the tapestry that is all. Tap on your third eye and know you are connected always to this pure source energy and it holds all in the highest regard and conspires with you to co-create exactly what you need in this pure and perfect moment. Release anxiety over the future. Abusive ambition. The need for control. And the limiting belief of less than until. Plugged into this grid of all. Feel this phenomenal and precious energy flow down and fill you with the truth. In this moment, as in every moment, you are enough. An individual and priceless piece of the cosmic DNA. Feel the dynamic connection between the star of you and the stars surrounding. And let go of the desire to become. Revel here with the cosmos. Celebrate with source in the miracle of you being. Just in this moment, Replace worry with gratitude. Self-criticism with self-compassion. Cynicism with sincerity. Bring your hands to your heart. Breathe deeply and feel how you are safely and perfectly tethered in this place, the heart of now, imbued and filled with the sparkly energy of divine presence. vessel traveling the magical spiral path of one unfolding moment 
witness to the ever constant miracle of you held and cherished by the incomprehensible perfection of presence of God goddess pure source energy breathe deeply and open your heart to this moment to the unlimited love found within it Let the love in with your breath. Let the love spill out with your breath. Every breath, every beat of your heart cleanses, protects, and intends for you to be open to receive this love whenever you need it because it is made of you and you are made of it. Every breath, every beat of your heart confirms God is present. God is presence and you are here now. Now when you're ready, wiggle your toes a little bit. Take a couple deep breaths. Feel free to reach your hands over your head and do a little stretching. They have vinyl. So um, as most of you know, unless you haven't been here for a while, um, we're going through the How to Pray Without Talking to God book for the study groups right now. And even though I'm not really reading anything out of here today, I feel like the topic is very pertinent to what this is all about. So I think you'll see what the connection is. So I'm going to tell you the story of how a new Lord's Prayer came to be. And it's very simple, but also maybe a little complicated. People ask me all the time, did you write the New Lord's Prayer? And it's a complicated answer because did I write the music for it? Yes. Did I have some help writing the music for it? Yes. But ultimately, I made the decisions about the music, which we'll, we'll get into there. But as far as the words go, um, the words basically are based on this book here by a man called Neil Douglas Klotz. And he happens to be, interestingly enough, uh, he was born and raised a Christian in a multilingual household, but later in life um, became a Sufi, of all things. And for the, anyone who's here who is part of the Sufis, they, they know Neil as Zadi, I believe. 
So, and he actually goes around the country doing dances of universal peace and talks and, and all kinds of things. And this, I'm not sure if this was one of his first books or not, but it was written in 1990. So it's, you know, it's been a while, what, almost 30 years. And what this book talks about is the Lord's Prayer, basically, but from not just the Aramaic version of the Bible, but from the Aramaic perspective. So what he did was he actually, he studied the Aramaic Bible. Like, I, I think, I'm not even sure I know how to pronounce this, but I think it's Peshitta. Is that, is that right? Okay. It's like the earliest version of the Aramaic. And so what scholars tell us is in Jesus' time, that's what people spoke, Aramaic. So Aramaic's the language that they spoke. So the original Lord's Prayer would have been in Aramaic of course. And the interesting thing is, you know, it, this all happened in the Middle East, so um, there's, a, there's a big difference culturally to how people view God in the East compared to the West, okay? So if the original words were from the East, basically, in the Aramaic language, there's no, well, kind of like what we're talking about in the book, right? There's no Santa Claus in the sky type of God. They didn't have any concept of that. To them, God was Allah, which basically means like all that is. So, which does that sound familiar to? Like, <laughs> um, so it's kind of interesting because even though Unity is called a New Thought Church, I'm not really sure that's 100% accurate. <laughs> you might really call it like an ancient thought church or a. An old thought church? I don't know. But, so interestingly enough, what happened was uh, the, the Bible basically, or I mean, it wasn't even the Bible then, it was like the, the New Testament and parts of the, the writings and things were actually translated from Aramaic to Greek, okay? So the Greeks, they didn't understand a lot of these Eastern concepts. So to them, oh, God was the gods, right? So... Zeus and, you know, everybody, all the gods and goddesses, so they had both. So when they were translating this, I mean, this is at least the way I'm kind of reading into it. It doesn't say anything like this in the book. But they had to make it applicable to people who understand to that culture, right? So if they had no concept of all that is, it didn't make sense to me, but I know who Zeus is. And if there's one god, and it has to be one god over everything, then I guess Zeus is the god, Right? So I believe, I mean, that's just my opinion of probably where the whole Our Father came from, the whole Father concept, right? Because in Aramaic, that wasn't the case. But in Greek, it definitely was. So they made it applicable to the Greeks, the Greeks to the Romans, the Romans and, the, you know, the Germans, and it got translated all the way up. And I, I think the kids are maybe talking about the whole telephone game thing, but if you can imagine going from <laughs> translation to translation to translation... The other thing is Aramaic is very much a oral tradition language. So it wasn't really, and back then, you know, people didn't read books, right? There was no writings and stuff like that. The scribes got to, and the priests got to read books and decipher what everything meant, but the common people didn't have anything like that. So the interesting thing that I found out from this book is like every line of the Lord's Prayer has several possible meanings depending on who's saying it, what time of day they're saying it, what their inflection is. Um, kind of like if we were to say, if, if you saw something written in a book and it said, like, that's great, right? So you saw, that's great, period. It could be, that's great, or that's great. You know, so it kind of depends on who's actually reading it, their inflection, everything like that. So what he found out when he went to the Aramaic and actually translated it, he went to the Middle East and he actually learned their culture and found out that there's maybe eight different possible translations for every word. They're pretty close and they kind of have the same feeling, but they're different. So how the New Lord's Prayer came about is I just kind of had an intuitive hit like it would be like this community at the time, this was in 2006, 
I wasn't music director yet. I was the service musician. Brian Schultz was the music director. Marshall Norman was the minister. I felt like this would be a good thing for the community and like people would enjoy it and get something out of it. It might help them get more into the, the Lord's Prayer. Um, and so what I did was I went to them and I said, do you mind if I try to come up with something? And Brian said, sure. You know, Brian, how many of you know Brian? Yeah, great guy, isn't he? He's like, sure, what, you know, do what you want. You know, I'll help you out, whatever you want to do. Um, I talked to Marshall, and he was like, sure, that sounds interesting, but of course he wanted to see like, how it progressed and like, what the words were going to be and stuff and, and everything. So what I did was I went through this book, and I'm just going to give you kind of a little example of the first line of the Lord's Prayer, which, you know, in a traditional Christian church that you would probably hear somewhere else in town, they would say, Our Father, which art in heaven. Okay? The other, the other cool thing about um, this book is not only do they give you the comparisons of, of what's happening, but they also show you the actual Aramaic, first of all. Second of all, they, they give you the English kind of pronunciation for it so you can actually say it if you wanted to, although it's kind of difficult to say if you've never said it before. And at the end of every, you know, so it goes through then possible translations so possible literal translations. So they're, these aren't just like made up. These are, they could, they're all considered literal because of, again, there's multiple meanings for certain words depending on the context, etc. And then they actually go through like a body prayer to match with it. I don't have time to go through all that stuff. But maybe, you know, someday, I mean, you could easily do like a year on this book. Um, even though it's a very small book and the, the Lord's Prayer part of this book is only half the book. Because the other half of the book, it talks about the Beatitudes. So it's very, I mean, you could literally read this through in half hour, but you could also read it like for the rest of your life. So um, if that makes any sense to you. So let's just go through that first line and possible. So our Father, which art in heaven, to an Aramaic listener with the words in Aramaic might have heard... O thou, the breathing life of all, creator of the shimmering sound that touches us. One possible translation. Respiration of all worlds. We hear you breathing in and out in silence. So this is the first line. So what I did with all these is I basically read through all of these line by line and picked, first of all, what I thought inspired me what I thought resonated with me, and then what I thought would actually work as a song. Because some of this stuff is, doesn't really flow. It doesn't flow like you're going to be able to sing it, okay? So what I ended up using was Radiant One. And here, I actually changed this a little bit. Ha! Ah, I didn't take the, well, I'll tell you what happened. Radiant One, you shine within us, outside us. Even darkness shines when we remember. I actually wrote the song out. No, I, so I picked the words. Picked the words, showed them to the minister, Marshall. Said, what do you think of the words? He read them through. He's like, the words are fine. You can, like, continue. So then I actually <laughs> wrote the music. And so that's what I did. I wrote the, uh, the whole music. It probably took, like, an hour. Wrote the, the melody all the way through and then decided... Now I have to figure out the chord progression. So did that, kind of made everything that made sense, and I had, got it right here, version one. Version one is not version 15, which is what we sing now. <laughs> so what happened was I asked Brian, I said, Brian, can I, can I teach this song to the choir? And he said, sure. Because at the time, I was a service musician, but I was also the accompanist for the choir. So after choir practice one day, I taught them the song, and we sang through it a few times, and then I kind of took notes. Kind of like when um, Hollywood film producers do a movie, right? They do a movie, show it to a focus group. They're like, what do you think? You like the ending? You like the beginning? You don't like it? 
And then usually from the feedback, they change the movie. They might change the ending, they might change the beginning, might re-edit some things, whatever. That's pretty much what I did with this. And the reason I did it is because I wanted to make sure, number one, that this song was singable for anyone, number one. Number two, to make sure that, that it flowed in a way that if you've never sung it before, it makes sense what happens. You know what I mean? There's no weird, oh, it went there. It's, if you've never heard it before and you're singing it, it's going to make sense to you. And I also tried to make it so that it was interesting because if you're going to sing it over and over again a hundred times, we have to have some key changes and modulation and things like that. And it has to get quieter and softer and, and, and things so that it actually can be sung over and over again without it kind of getting old, if that makes sense. So anyway, we played it through with the choir, and it did not go well. <laughs> and the only reason it didn't go well is because the beginning was just not good. I tried to use these words exactly as they were, and it just, it wasn't flowing. So it was, you know, radiant one, you shine within us, outside us. That whole part was just not working. So what I, so, and I figured that out once I actually heard somebody singing it. So that was helpful to hear the singing. Um, so basically what I did was I, you know, so took people's advice and there, there were certain other parts that I just really didn't like. I asked Brian what he thought. He thought the music was fine, but he's like, this is just like a nonstop. He says, you need to keep, you get something in there to make it breathe, basically. That was his contribution. He's like, you need space. People are saying words over and over again. You need like a couple of extra measures of rests or something in here just so people can kind of take it in and are just not plowing through it. So basically what I did was I went back home and I'm like, okay, so the first thing I did was I put some spaces in so that, you know, you could sing it without like losing your breath, Right? because that's kind of like the, the exact opposite of what I wanted to have happen. I don't want people to lose their breath. I want them to feel more breath, right? Um, and then I just totally reworked the beginning because the beginning was just not working. And the original words that I had used, which I you know, told you before, you shine within us, outside us, even darkness shines, became you shine always. I figured if it's inside, outside, everywhere, it's always. So... I actually made that. That didn't come from Neil. That was my, my thing. Another thing is I, I switched around some words, not to change meaning, but just you could use it either way, and it just flowed better. So, But after 15 revisions, I finally had what I think Marshall was happy with, what Brian was happy with, and what I was happy with. And then I made one... I made one last change. I changed the key. <sighs> to basically bring the divine feminine back to the prayer. <sighs> I originally wrote it in C. C is, if you know, the something about the chakras, at least what I understand about them is that the key of C is kind of the, the root chakra, and it goes up from there, okay? So I had originally writ, wrote it in C, and I thought there's been too much patriarchy, there's been too much um, masculine energy associated with the prayer. So I, I moved it up a key to be the sacral chakra with the divine feminine. So that was... <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> but I thought that was really appropriate to do, so thank you. Oh, oh, thank you. Anyway, Ooh, got through that. So that, that was the, the final, that was the final, final thing before we actually put it in what we used to have the white binders and then, you know, from there it just kind of happened. And uh, the whole process took about six weeks between 
I first introduced it to the choir to where it ended up today. So that's pretty much where it came from. And again, I would, I would really recommend this book, Prayers of the Cosmos. Um, Neil also wrote another book called Blessings of the Cosmos where he takes other passages from the Bible, basically, that are famous, and he takes the Aramaic version and he translates, translates it to what he feels is a more accurate translation based on what he understands of, of the Aramaic language. Um, and so a lot of so when I was talking thinking about this too, I, I kind of hearken back to when I was uh, when I did my talk a couple months ago, and we were talking about um, the four agreements. If anybody remembers the four agreements, what we were talking about for that. And the four in the four agreements, they talk about symbols and they talk about language. And so today we're talking about symbols and language and. One of the things I remember from that is that symbols and language only point to the truth, right? They're not the truth. So even though we're talking about, you know, what's the translation, what should it be, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff, the important thing is the words that we use and the words, you know, that we, we speak, of course, as we're learning with affirmations and denials, right? They help us create our story but they're not the truth, okay? The truth is outside of language. The truth is outside of all of that. And so the first thing I would like to do is I would like you to actually hear what the Lord's Prayer sounds like in Aramaic from somebody who actually knows how to speak it, and that would be from Neil himself. So if you want, I would just invite you to close your eyes. There's not going to be nothing on the screen. So you can close your eyes and actually listen to Neil Douglas Klotz, the author of the book, Speak the Lord's Prayer in actual Aramaic. Wash Buklan, Haubain, Wachtahain, I cannot of Hanan, Schwachanel, Hayabain, Wela, Tachlan, Lenisuna, Ela, Patsan, Min Bisha, Natul de Lache Mal Kuta, Wahaila, Watesh Buchta, Lalam Al Amen. That's it. It's shorter than you would expect, right? It's because so many. Um, the vowels, all the vowels and the words mean stuff. and That's kind of how, where that came from. So I thought I would end today with actually um, doing something that I, like I, I did a, a little while, like um, the last time I talked, I, what I did was I got real quiet and I decided I was going to energetically send everyone a message and see if you would pick up on it. And... I think it went pretty well because people talked to me afterwards and said they thought it was kind of interesting. So I'd like to do it again. However, instead of me sending you a message, what I would like us all to do is all of us together send whatever message is in your heart out to the world and each other. So we're going to do this however you feel comfortable doing it. But what I mean, so if that's you put your hands out and you send it, your eyes are closed, your eyes are open, it doesn't really matter what, to, what you're going to do. But we're going to actually energetically communicate rather than with words. And to me, that's going to get us very close, if not at the truth. So I invite you to close your eyes or keep them open, whatever you want to do. Take a deep breath in and release it. Another deep breath in, release, and now in whatever way you want to send that message, feel free to send it now.
invite you all to take another deep breath and release. Thank you. Could you feel that? All that amazing energy? So I'm just going to end by saying a new Lord's Prayer. You decide.